Okay, we'll go live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first virtual talk of the year. My name is Nathan Mannion, I'm the head of exhibitions and programs at Epic Irish Immigration Museum. Thank you for joining us this evening. Do feel free to post any questions or comments in the chat. And tonight's event will be led by our historian residence here at the museum, Dr. Morris Casey, and our guest speaker is Dr. Sophie Cooper. Morris. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Nathan. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on this Thursday evening for what promises to be a fascinating discussion. So today we will be traveling to the cities of Chicago and Melbourne in the 19th and early 20th centuries with our expert guide, Dr. Sophie Cooper. Uh, Sophie is a lecturer in liberal arts at Queen's University Belfast and the author of a forthcoming book titled Forging Identities in the Irish World, Melbourne and Chicago, 1830 to 1922, which will be available next month with Edinburgh University Press. So given that you're all tuning into a talk from Epic, I'm sure that you will all also find a lot of interesting material on the Irish Diaspora Histories website, which Sophie also runs and something which has been also really valuable for me in my own work. <clears throat> but tonight I'll be talking with Sophie specifically about her new book and some of the themes and questions and arguments that it explores. And also before we get into the discussion, I wanted to just let you know about how, how you can all participate also. So as Nathan mentioned, you can drop comments and questions in the YouTube chat and they'll be related to me and then I can we can uh, talk through them and I'd want to invite you as well to feel free to type at any time so it's a it's a conversation so you can feel free to join in whenever you like whenever you want to um, contribute. So then to begin hello Sophie uh, thanks so much for in joining us and I'd like just to begin if you'd give us a kind of an overview and introduction to how the book came about and, and what story it tells. Thanks so much and thanks for having me here. So um, the book kind of started, well, it started quite a few years ago and um, some of the themes I explore in it started when I was still an undergraduate student. Um, so I kind of got hooked on the idea of Irish American nationalism, um, particularly in Chicago uh, from the 1880s, uh, the, the kind of dramatic murder that happens in 1889 and Gillian O'Brien's written a great book about it. So highly recommend that. Um, but what kept kind of kept coming up was why uh, Irish nationalism and these Irish communities kind of developed in the way that they did in America and particularly in Chicago. So this continued into my master's research, which I looked at the Irish American dynamite campaign. Um, and then for my PhD, I really wanted to look at the Irish in Chicago again, but taking that much wider look at it. So starting a lot earlier than a lot of the books on the Irish in Chicago start, most of them start in the 1880s. So I wanted to back a bit further, but I really wanted to develop this um, comparative kind of lens. So I kind of looked around for a comparison. My uh, supervisor suggested Glasgow. I felt that I wanted to go to Australia. So I chose Melbourne, but thankfully um, the comparison between Chicago and Melbourne is really important and it, it really works. And I can expand on that a bit more. Um, but basically these two um, cities are settled by Europeans around the same time in the 1830s. Before that, I need to acknowledge that these are thriving communities anyway. So in Chicago, um, the Potawatomi people um, have a major trading post where Chicago will be. Um, in Australia, the Kulin Nation, um, the area that will become Melbourne is a really important meeting point. So these aren't kind of empty lands, um, but European settlers move in there in the 1830s and the Irish are there from the start, both cases. Um, and so looking at two places that kind of develop at the same time, they both kind of massively expand in the 1840s and 50s, becoming this kind of second cities of both country um, within a matter of decades. Um, having Irish people there is about 20% of the population for most of the, well, for the middle of the 19th century 
is really important in developing this kind of comparison. So what it is to be Irish and how um, and how to kind of perform that I Irishness, but also who gets to say who is Irish uh, and what that Irishness means. So one of the key kind of things that I develop in my book is the role of women, especially uh, women as kind of community leaders, as teachers, women religious or nuns, um, as kind of people that are saying what it is to be Irish and Irish Catholic, especially, although I do talk about Protestants quite a lot, um, but what it means to be Irish from kind of cradle to grave. So not just focusing on what Irish men um, who are traditional kind of power brokers um, are saying about being Irish, but how those kind of networks come about across multiple generations. So that's probably the key thing, but it also looks at the kind of development of each city as well and the kind of way that the Catholic Church evolves, the way that associational culture evolves, and also crucially how education um, has a big effect on that. Mm -hmm. And I guess sticking with that idea of what you just mentioned there about the role of Catholicism and also coming back to what you're saying about, you know, who gets to define, who gets to be Irish and all these kind of questions. What have you found? And I, I guess it opens up a huge whole topic in terms of religious identity and the differences between these two cities and also the commonalities and how that shapes Irishness in the period you look at. Well, it's quite interesting because um, traditionally, scholars of the Irish in Australia have kind of said that Irish people leave their Irishness at the door. Well, as the minute they get off, because um, they're in a colonial city. Uh, Melbourne is a colonial city for the whole time that I'm talking about. It does get self governance um, a lot earlier than a lot of places in the empire. Um, but you have kind of uh, David Fitzpatrick talks about how it's the second sons that are going to Melbourne. So um, it's not the, the wealthy landowners, but it's the second sons who have got status. They're often middle class. Um, they are a mix of Catholic and Protestant. The gold rushes bring huge amounts of people in the 1850s to Melbourne. Um, so you've got a slightly different class base um, of Irish people. You've got people who are the very poorest of society, but you also have, I mean, one of the major um, kind of philanthropists in Melbourne from the 1840s is Redmond Barry, who is an Anglo-Irishman, uh, one of the first premiers of um, Victoria, the, the colony that um, Melbourne's in, is an Irish Catholic. So you have Irish people and Irish Catholics becoming very powerful quite early on. That's not to say that there isn't anti-Irish, uh, anti-Irishness and anti-Catholicism. That is widespread, but you have, it, it kind of manifests in slightly different ways. In Chicago, you have, um, it's also an interesting one because often we think of kind of Irish cities as New York or Boston, which have been around for, you know, generations by the 1830s, 1840s. And they have a very established kind of Protestant waspy um, elite that doesn't exist in the same way in Chicago. So you have uh, Irish Catholics being able to go in and move around society a lot more, though they do tend to be poorer uh, when they go in. Um, but this has a big kind of impact. So in Melbourne for most 19th century, to be Catholic means to be Irish, more or less, but to be Irish mean, doesn't mean that you're Catholic. So it is a very Irish Catholic church in Melbourne. In Chicago, you've got a very plural Catholic church. You've got a lot of Germans, you've got a lot of Irish to start with, and then this kind of different waves of migrants come in. So you have Italians, Polish, a um, whole different um, kind of, it's a different um, kind of setup but you have the ethnic parish from 1844 in Chicago, which means that Irish people are um, only going to church with Irish people. Germans are only going to church with German people and they do it through their languages. The Irish church is traditionally done through English, but uh, the German church, for example, is done through German. And this has a big effect. So there's a kind of, uh, I guess, something that I found really interesting in reading your book was, 
some of the examples that show a fluidity of identity almost, or kind of challenge our kind of preconceptions. And one really interesting one that you talked about was hurling in Melbourne. And I wonder if you just outline for the audience what you found in terms of hurling in Melbourne. So a lot of people, if you know the kind of history of hurling, it, it goes way back, but um, penal laws and various kind of uh, repressive um, laws in Ireland meant that hurling, one of the kind of traditional Gaelic games, um, isn't kind of allowed to happen. It, it doesn't mean that it's gone, but it, it's not allowed to happen in the same way as um, kind of British sports, cricket and things like that. Um, but then you have the um, kind of um, Gaelic revival from the 1880s and Gaelic games, including Erling, is kind of codified and becomes very popular again um, within the Gaelic Association, Athletic Association. In Melbourne, what you find, and you see that in Chicago, like hurling as an organised sport um, doesn't really get going until the mid-1880s. Um, so it, that's very led by Ireland. In Melbourne, though, you have hurling pops up again and again so in the 1840s for example all of a sudden these hurling matches are um organized mainly on the 12th of july um mainly because it means that people can walk around with hurley like with big sticks um in case they're attacked so um the this organization of hurling matches um means that um 12th of july parades are cancelled repeatedly until all parading is banned in Melbourne from 1846. Now it starts to come back a lot earlier than we see in a codified way in um, kind of popularized in Ireland and it comes through the Hockey Association at Trinity College Dublin. So the Hockey Association is codified and within this you see a uh, Identification of the rules in about 1873, 74. And because you've got a lot of people who are being trained at Trinity who then come back, uh, either go to Melbourne or there's there's movement between Melbourne and Dublin because of um, how you kind of get called to the bar. So you've got a lot of lawyers who are moving between um, the Inns of Court in Dublin and in Melbourne. Um, and so you start seeing hurling matches happening, um, kind of intercity ones as well, from about 1874. And you have them being played on Christmas Day, St. Stephen's Day, and the Queen's birthday. So it's a really interesting way of kind of looking at um, how sport is being used as kind of, well, where the kind of motivation is coming from, but also, uh, and who the motivation is coming from, because the class dimension of GAA is also really important. Um, but also how in a colonial city, sport can be used to show different identities in kind of, sometimes a kind of softer way uh, and more appropriate way. But obviously appropriateness is context specific. But yeah. yeah, I was just, um, I was very taken because <clears throat> my, preconception would be that Erling was a kind of hotbed of Irish nationalism in the diaspora and this idea of Trinity educated people hurling on the Queen's birthday just it's really kind of um, upended kind of kind of preconceptions. Um, I wanted to also think about something that you think about really or you write about really thoughtfully in the book is the question of gender um, in really every aspect uh, in education in politics and particularly in religious life as well. And I was wondering if we kind of start, I guess, with women in religious life and how you, what, I guess that's linked to education as well and, and what you found there and, and what kind of stories you felt have not yet been told about that experience. Yeah, um, I think, so one of the kind of big thing that was, like that I hadn't really realized was how important women religious are. And we use women religious as a kind of catch-all term for, for nuns who take various different kind of vows. 
Um, and I mean, women, lay women are really important and I can talk about that. Um, but all of a sudden I became just slightly obsessed with nuns, um, which is interesting. Um, but the, they, I mean, they effectively set up the social services in Melbourne and Chicago. Um, they, you know, women like Agatha O'Brien, who I wrote about this week, um, like, she, they're right. They're signing legal contracts. They're like they're twenty four and they're running orphanages, uh, schools, private like parochial schools, private schools, and um, and hospitals. And they're doing all of this between like nine of them, and they are running all of those institutions as well. But because of the way that the archives are set up and things like that. Often when you read like the history of a Catholic church or a history of women in, um, in a city, you don't, the history, like the scholarship on them don't come together. So the Catholic church archives tend to be diocesan. They tend to focus on bishops and priests uh, because religious orders are separate to that. Their archives are elsewhere. So you actually have to, you know, travel to these different places, get different access. And so, and also you're reading different things because historians of the Catholic Church will just use the diocesan archives traditionally. And then historians of education will look at something else and historians of women religious will look at something else. So all of a sudden you're missing how all of these things intersect. And urban historians don't always look at the religious elements and, and things like that because of civic focus. So you have all this connection, but then these women are working with lay women, so non kind of people that haven't taken the vows. Um, so they're working at different levels. So, you know, if you've got a group of nuns um, running the local school, they're like they're working with the parents in that area. And so between them, they are deciding kind of, you know, what the local school puts on. Um, as a play to fundraise for the school and so you have this kind of reflection in um, message but you also have Irish women being typically to cater to Irish children like Irish descended children in both cities so I've kind of used a term from sociology which is ethnic mirroring which is basically saying you know um, if you've got good role models in your um, kind of ethnic community or class community you are likely to want to identify in that way even if it's subconscious and say well that person is sounds like my parents but also is you know a figure of authority educated well traveled and um, then you are probably more likely to you know want to continue your education want to do all of these things so because these women kind of set up a lot of the schools you then see um loads of uh, Irish descended girls and women then becoming teachers. So then they go into the public school system or they become trade union organizers or they become, you know, uh, or they, they become parents, um, but they keep people within that network. So even just by kind of refiguring the kind of um, the timeline, you can all of a and start saying oh okay there's actually th this kind of line of in influence and I do think that's mm. also why it's important to start earlier so not just go in at the 1880s <clears throat> but actually look back to the 1840s the 1850s and see how these um, institutions are developing. And I was interested in what you're saying there about these lines of influence do you know that they stretch to Ireland as in would a teenage girl in Ireland know that there's a life of kind of autonomy and meaningful work in Chicago and Melbourne through this route or would it have been people growing up in Chicago and Melbourne who went into those roles? Oh massively I mean both to be fair um, convent schools in the diaspora tended to you know um, encourage girls to then continue on we can see that kind of uh, line definitely but I mean even if you think of being Irish today like Morris you can probably think a family member or abroad this goes back way to the like 
1840s, but way before this. So we have what's called chain migration. Um, so family members, one family member goes abroad, saves enough money, pays for a ticket to come back. The Irish are really quite famous for doing this. And it is often female networks that are funding that. But um, so you've got that kind of um, familial link, but you have um, it, it's really popular in um, religious orders as well. It's one of the kind of key messages. Even if you look at um, films from the 18th, uh, no, sorry, from the 1930s, girls are being interviewed at convent schools and they get asked why they want to join religious orders. And they're like, because we get to travel, we get to abroad. So it, it's one of the big kind of selling points. And I mean, Rosalie Minello and Colin Barr have written about the specific villages that girls go to in order to be trained up to become missionaries. So it, it's a very popular thing. It's a very well-known thing. We've got people going out from the 1840s um, to Pittsburgh, but also you've got, um, I've got one woman who went to New Zealand in the 1860s and like she learned Maori languages on the way out. So these are educated, they're curious women. Um, and yeah, it's a life of, of adventure even if a lot of them die of cholera quite quickly. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that is um, a difficulty of this, this period. Um, though I suppose we're no strangers to, to illness in these years either. I wanted to mm. come as well to back to something you were just mentioning there about women in trade union politics and women in politics more broadly, because it's another very strong theme of the book is politics in the diaspora and the contours of it. And I was wondering um, in what ways was politics in the diaspora in these two cities gendered? Mm -hmm. um, so the politics in these two cities are very different, especially when it comes to Irish nationalism. Um, largely because, as I've said, Melbourne is a colonial city. Um, it's also very far away from um, from Ireland. Um, we're talking months of travel, whereas Chicago is a few weeks usually. And Chicago is within the United States, so it has kind of this Republican heritage. Um, the US freed itself from British rule through violence. Um, so you've got very different things there. Um, high politics is very male. Like there's no way of getting around it in either place. Um, but you start seeing women, especially in Chicago, getting very involved in reform movements and in the trade union movement um, from um, the, well, from the kind of 1860s or so. Um, Tara um, McCarthy's written a really good book on that. Um, but you see them kind of coming in in ways. So um, if you look at kind of fundraising lists for Irish nationalist funds, even from like 1869, you've got um, like half and like even in Melbourne, the fundraising list, half of the, the, the people who are donating are women. Um, so they may not have had a massive voice, but they, um, they are kind of, they're being part of it. Um, same in um, the US as well, in Chicago. You see them get more involved through um, kind of lobby groups, um, especially through the Catholic Church, but um, these are industrializing cities. Chicago more so than Melbourne, but they are industrializing cities. So uh, you've got a lot of women with, you know, a bit of extra money. Um, you've also got women who um, are becoming quite powerful within um, different trade union movements. So the Knights of Labour um, in Chicago, there's a number of kind of um, centres, I suppose, that um, are led by women by the turn of the century. People like Mother Jones, who people probably will have heard of. Um, but yeah, so they keep, and Margaret, Halley, who is um, really powerful within the teachers union as well. So as well as this whole education thing, like, yes, they're influencing the day to day lives of um, the children under their care, but they're also advancing through 
union politics as well. And you get things like um, the girls or like the women go round to people's houses to um, sew, you know, strike banners and they all sit there singing Irish songs. And uh, there's Maud gone um, strike, uh, I mean, kind of mini uh, trade union branches and things like that in Chicago. So um, people are very clearly connecting that kind of ethnicity to um, their workers kind of um, identity as well. Mm. <clears throat> That's really fascinating. Um, <clears throat> I was also going to ask, like, I guess kind of um, taking the lens a step back and looking into where the Irish in both these cities fit into, you know, where they sit alongside other communities. We're talking about African-American community, you've already mentioned German migrant communities, indigenous Australians and so on. Um, how do the Irish interact with those communities and is there much interaction? Mm -hmm. So in Melbourne, uh, well, in both cities, there isn't, there aren't like ethnic ghettos, uh, especially in the 19th century. So, um, so Irish people live everywhere. There tends to be kind of enclaves, but that is often to do with where they work. Um, so south side of Chicago, for example, it's right near the, the stockyards, it's next to the, the railway lines. That is where a lot of Irish people work. So you have a lot of Irish people living. There. But there's also a lot of, say in Pullman, there's a lot of African-Americans live there, uh, a lot of Germans. Um, as the 20th century goes on, as Chicago is quite famous for, um, you get a lot of more splits on racial lines. Um, the Chicago race riots for 1919 is a very clear kind of outcome of that. Um, but you do have a lot of kind of living together, living in similar areas. But what you do have because of the ethnic parish in Chicago is that you will still only go to church with with certain people you'll go to the school so even if you have say two churches on one block which is unusual but say within two blocks um you will walk past a, an Irish person will walk past a German person on the way to church and they will even if they work together they will go to different churches their children will go to different schools um for a lot of the 19th, well into the 20th century. So there's a tradition in Chicago about, you don't ask what street someone's from or what area someone's from, you ask what parish they're from. Now this goes up until like the 1960s uh, because that telling you what parish they're from will tell you about their class, it'll tell you about their ethnic background. Um, so that's an important kind of signifier. In Melbourne, um, you have, again, um, there are enclaves, but there aren't these kind of, there isn't this separation. You have areas like Emerald Hill, which tends to have more Irish people in, but not necessarily. Um, and this changes as well as Irish people join the middle class in, in large areas, same within Chicago, and you start getting white flight and things like that. Um, so then they move out of these areas. Um, in Melbourne, there's a lot more mixed mixing mainly because um, of the way that migration to Australia works. So uh, in Melbourne, it's people who are largely kind of ghettoized, um, not through any choice of their own. There are specific laws in place that mean that Chinese people can only live in certain areas, which means that other people, uh, non-Chinese people tend to live together. Aboriginal people are there but they are increasingly being pushed out of um, the centre. Um, so it's a lot more mixed, but it is a lot more mixed than we tend to think of Australia uh, being, or Melbourne being, partly because of the gold rushes. Um, the gold rushes in the 1850s brought people like African-Americans, they brought uh, people from all over the, um, the empire they uh, brought loads of Scandinavians and things like that but the majority of Melbourne is made up of people of British and Irish descent um, again this is where religion comes in they might all work together but if you are Irish and Protestant from like the 1870s really you you start kind of mixing on a class basis more um, whereas Irish Catholics might 
stay a bit more separate, but especially Irish Protestant middle classes and elite people, they kind of just are subsumed into a British um, background. Same with a lot of, even more so I'd say, Irish Protestants in Chicago, they just become part of the kind of waspy like background. Mm. And while we're sticking with a kind of um, broader view, I was wondering if you could kind of speak to how the Irish shape these cities in terms of kind of urban development and the kind of a broader urban history of the cities through the Irish contribution. Um, and perhaps whether on your visits to these cities, there is still that kind of Irish mark on the, the urban landscape itself. Yeah, um, I really love the kind of thinking about the kind of when you walk around these cities, because you can look, look at these cities on a map and be like, oh, okay, cool, like that's from there to there. But um, the environmental factors have a massive impact so um, on both of these cities. So, so in um, so in the 1840s and 50s, these are really kind of them. I talk a lot a lot in my book about mud. Like these are just really muddy cities. In Melbourne, they start um, kind of developing the city quite a lot in the 1840s. But then the gold happens, and a lot of the especially young, um, physically able men suddenly they don't want to be in the city doing building work they want to go and find their fortune so they all run off to the gold fields which leaves everyone else in Melbourne basically just walking around in mud um, and not being able to build anything for a while so um, that kind of slows things down in Chicago you have I mean it's literally built by Lake Michigan it, it's basically swampland um, so you have a lot of kind of Irish Catholic, well, Irish people are needed purely to build or largely to build. Um, so they're really important in both um, places, um, especially because, I mean, we talk about a lot about like skilled labor and how a lot of Irish migrants in the 19th century were unskilled. They weren't, they just weren't, you know, professionally skilled maybe they were well used to working the land they were well used to kind of building they were well used to working in teams you tend to find a lot of Irish people um becoming kind of bricklayers masons because they have that knowledge and so they're really kind of central to the development of building practices in both cities um so this is really important um but then you keep having things like so in Melbourne when the gold rushes kind of die, die down. Everyone comes back to Melbourne so you have this massive building boom and that's great. And it, and most of, well, most of that is still there or a lot of it's still there. So um, when you go to Melbourne, you can still walk and you can be like, oh, okay, this is where they built St. Francis's Church, which became St. Patrick's Cathedral. You can walk and be like, oh, okay, well, there's where the convent was. This is the Catholic area which is built on the other side of um, the city. I mean, Melbourne, old, old Melbourne city is quite, it's a small area, but the CBD, um, you can see it's on the other end of the street to the Protestant cathedral. So you've got this kind of laying out of the city in different ways. And you can still walk around that. You can still see the buildings that were built in the 1870s um, and yeah, so it's amazing because you can just imagine that and then you can be like, oh, OK, well, that's where the cemetery is. I can I can do that walk. Whereas in Chicago, because it kept burning down effectively, um, it, you know, the Chicago fire of 1871, as soon as that burnt down most of the city centre, obviously Irish immigrants very famous with um the Chicago fire because apparently it was started by Mrs O'Leary's cow probably not but um that the O'Leary's house was the last house standing for you know miles because uh, because of the industrialization in the city there was a layer of fat effectively across the river which meant that the, the fire jumped um as soon as kind of people had started rebuilding from there 
1875, there's another fire. And it just keeps getting burnt down. So um, this has a massive effect. Then 1920s, Chicago's architecture from there, if you've ever done one of the river cruises, like it, it's such a 1920s city. And so for me, walking around Chicago, I can see all these places, but they've, they've changed a lot. Um, and there's just, yeah, it's just a different city to walk around, especially if you want to consider that kind of 19th um, yeah, legacy, I suppose. So I guess because we've been brought up to the present day, um, I've got a little more questions, but I'll hold them back because I want to get some audience questions. Um, and the first one is from Kay, who asks, Sophie, did you find that the backlash in Melbourne against the Earl Grey orphan girls in 1848-1850 was based on anti-Catholicism or were there other reasons also? Really good question. Um, I think, it, so it was partly to do with anti-Catholicism. It's also class, it's also gendered. Um, so for those of people that don't know about the Earl Grey orphan girls, um, there was a scheme set up in houses in Ireland um, where basically girls and women, and they were largely from about the age of 15 to about 25. There were people that did women that sneak in on either side, but largely this. So the, the terms is also slightly, you know, problematic. Well, not problematic, but more complex. And also they weren't all orphans, but they are collectively known as this. So about 4,000 of them were sent out to the Australian colonies, largely to become the like the mothers of the nation. Um, they wanted this with the gold rushes and before that, this was a very largely male population. So they wanted respectable girls, women, white girls and women to go out to become the mothers of the nation. Um, when they arrived, some of these women were pregnant, they were raggedy, they weren't the fancy people that um, some people expected them to be. Um, but all of these rumours started that they were actually prostitutes, they were, they were criminals and all of this. So, um, and this was largely anti-Catholic uh, and anti-Irish. So it was a mixture of those, those two things, the fact that they're coming from Ireland. Um, because there's a lot of worry around the time. There's also a lot of worry about Irish women um, having children with Chinese men. So this is a time of you know racial hierarchies, everything like that, saving the purity of the white race, all of those kinds of well, quite horrific ideas. But um, so the fact that these were kind of low-born women um, added to that worry. It's quite interesting in Melbourne because this is kind of Archbishop Gould, who just arrived um, from Ireland to become the Bishop of, Archbishop of Melbourne. He'd already got in a bit of a fight with the, um, the Church of England, well, the Anglican Bishop. Um, and so this was kind of his moment to make a stand on behalf of the Irish Catholics of Australia and especially of Melbourne. So um, he gets involved immediately and he says, you know, these are all mass going girls, they're respectable. Um, they, you know, they're good people. And you get, um, but there are letters sent back to Queen Victoria complaining that they have arrived. And so actually you get this massive kind of group of Irish middle-class uh, men, especially who come to their defense. And these are Catholics and Protestants who see this as an attack on Ireland. Um, so it's quite interesting because um, this is a moment that really kind of bonds the Irish community in Melbourne together in defense of these women. So I would say it's a lot about respectability, a lot on gendered ideas of respectability, but also a good helping of anti-Irishness and anti catholicism And do you find similar tropes of anti-Irishness in Chicago? Are, are these people kind of drinking from the same poisoned well, so to speak, in terms of getting their ideas? Yes, definitely. Um, and you see this throughout the 19th into the 20th century. 
Um, if anyone's seen any Thomas Nast cartoons, they're, they're quite famous. Um, they um, tend to show, especially Irish people, kind of as violent, drunken, or um, kind of um, dupes of the Catholic Church. And we see this kind of idea of um, this kind of duality of Irish Catholics as kind of on one hand violent aggressive kind of threats within especially when there's kind of um like the Irish American Dynamite campaign things like that and Henry O'Farrell like you see this side but then you also see uh, another side of the portrayals of Irish people especially Irish Catholics as kind of dupes as naive stupid or um just kind of a bit innocent as well and so you have this kind of this dual negative trope of violent and dupe of either Catholic, the Catholic Church or of nationalist organising. And they, these are both kind of picked into. In Melbourne, when things go a bit awry in 1868, when um, an Irishman, Henry O'Farrell, shoots um, Queen Victoria's son while he's on a trip there, um, people immediately, uh, the kind of mainstream press start say, oh, well, the Fenians are doing this in America. So the, they're doing that in America. So it's obviously the same and we just haven't noticed yet. So they're kind of printing, like you look at Australian newspapers, they're printing newspaper columns from America. Um, you have um, kind of ministers who travel around the world preaching kind of anti-Catholicism. You also have things like the Maria Monk um, kind of, pamphlets which warn of the evils of convents um, trying to kidnap Protestant girls. Um, so you have this kind of, yeah, this kind of um, well of, um, of anti-Catholicism that is tapped into the ways that the Catholic Church or Catholics in both cities kind of varies and it really depends on the time. I mean in um, in Chicago in the 1850s, there's this upsurge of anti-Catholicism, but also anti-immigrant sentiment. So the, the kind of rise of the know-nothings. Um, and you have um, all the nativist party. And so you have Le Levi Boom, who's elected mayor of Chicago, I think 1853 or 1854. Um, and he all immigrants from getting government contracts he also there's various things over the years where they try and kind of curb who gets liquor licenses who can open saloons and everything and every time this happens the Irish Catholics and the uh, well the Irish and the Germans get together and say like no that's that's not happening so Levi Boone is voted out within a year of being there because um because in the 1850s 52 percent or something of Chicago's population are immigrants. You can't just ban half the population, especially when you need them to actually build the city. Um, so yeah, different things happen. Also, there's a lot of kind of anti-Catholicism aimed at, well, it, it's often done through cartoons and kind of snidely because in Australia, for example, you have freedom of religion. You don't have an established church there. Um, so you have it done in different ways. Often the women religious are exempt from this or not attacked in the same way because they're seen as doing a public service, whereas priests are attacked in different ways. Yeah, it's all um, so complex and fascinating. Thanks. Uh, there's more comments and questions. Uh, one from Jay O'Brien who asks, has Sylvia had an opportunity to explore the work of Mother Baptist Russell in San Francisco in the late 1850s? It's a new name to me. I have come across the name, but because I was looking at Chicago, I've kind of focused on, on that side of things. But um, one of my favourite things to do, it, it's, you know, a niche pastime, that is when I'm in an archive asking um my uh, asking the archivist like what's your favorite bit of the archive and um the sisters of mercy came up with some some great stuff in, in their archive um but i will note down that name and i will look her up because i'm sure she's excellent 
Uh, yes, and there's a further follow-up from J. O'Brien who notes that Mother Baptist was Sister Charles Ruffle, Russell, Lord Chief Justice of England, oh, okay. 1900, and of Matthew Russell, S.J., founder of Irish Monthly, and a niece of Charles Russell, Russell President of Renewth. Uh, so a lot there, a lot of threads. Um, a question yeah. as well from Patrick O'Sullivan who asks, did you find any particular aspect of theory helpful and did the contrast between Chicago and Melbourne encourage you or require you to interrogate theory? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. So I found that, I mean, I've, I use a lot of different theories, but I find Avatar Bra's um, diaspora spaces really useful. I mean, Bra uses um, focuses on Asian like women immigrants into Britain um, and well actually to to various places but she taught she thinks about this whole kind of idea of diaspora spaces as a space where things are constantly moving around and certain things get through kind of a barrier and other things don't so you've got to look at it as um, kind of look at the context as well as looking at what the community is doing and that kind of overlaps with Alan O'Day's work on kind of mutative, mutative I still can't say that word, ethnicity uh, about how it's part like ethnicity is part of daily life and um, so ethnicity there's often debates around you know is it just a symbol that people kind of like they're Irish on St Patrick's Day and that's it um, for a lot of people they are like that is as far as their kind of engagement with ethnicity goes. And that's absolutely fine. Um, For other people, it is like the kind of lasting community bond. It's often through this kind of community identity, uh, this everyday kind of interaction with it. And I kind of take that further to, um, I talk about kind of a foundational identity. Um, which is kind of an unconscious identity, which is built through this ethnic mirroring, but also the fact that you're going to school with other Irish or Irish descended children. So your friendship groups are already there. The clubs that you go to are already kind of located in an Irishness, even if you're not uh, explicitly kind of engaging with that. Um, And women are kind of key to that. So, um, and then it's when they reach kind of adulthood or late teenagedom that um, you have kind of the culture brokers, to use kind of John Belcham's term, um, who are traditionally the publican and the politician, this kind of male dominated space. And so then they can come in and kind of articulate a particular type of Irishness, but you need that kind of group but those friendships and those networks and you know that nepotism that you know if you are Irish in Chicago at certain times you will get a job because you identify as Irish but you need all of that and that this is something that parents are thinking about you know do I send my children to public school where they will meet lots of people from all different kinds of backgrounds or do I send them to a parochial school where they will meet Irish people who then we can use those contacts um, obviously there are, there are many reasons that send their children to different schools but these are all things that are being considered kind of consciously or not and um, so I kind of really like that and I do think that focusing on Melbourne and Chicago so this these kind of quite similar in some ways cities um, and I mean I can talk about the urban city uh, urban uh, kind of history theorists um, like Gunther Barth and people like this, the shock city idea. Um, but I do think trying to see how the where these kind of connections lie um, in comparison has really helped me kind of think about those kind of connections as well as in. Great. Um, we are Coming up to the last um, minutes or so, so I'd just like to encourage anyone who wants to get a question in to do so. Um, I had a kind of a hypothetical question, which is if you were to add a third city to the comparison, what one would you choose and what do you think it would tell you? Hmm. Um, So I would have maybe two suggestions 
where one of them I think would be somewhere like Sao Paulo or like in Argentina or South America somewhere but especially Sao Paulo because it's got a very strong Irish Catholic base there um I think that would be interesting because it's I mean one of the advantages that a lot of Irish people have in Melbourne and Chicago is that they're English speaking not all of them obviously um but they don't have like it gives them an employability kind of advantage um in Sao Paulo they don't have that um but there are big congregations of um kind of Irish communities there um and a lot of them have links so like sisters I think it's the Sisters of Mercy set up in Argentina but then they kind of get chucked out of there so they move to Adelaide and then they move back 10 years later so Sarah O'Brien's done some really interesting stuff on Irish identity in Argentina um but I think my actual kind of comparison would be Manchester which is kind of the original shock city um, so one of these cities that you know expanded hugely and became incredibly important very quickly it's got a lot of Irish people in it um, at different kind of levels of society a lot of the same orders that are working in Melbourne and Chicago are also working in Manchester uh, it's got the industrialization side of things so I think it would also be interesting because you know Manchester's a de- few days away from especially the east coast of Ireland then you've got Chicago which is a few weeks and then you've got um, Melbourne which is a few months so the development of technology um, and how quickly people can get around is really important for how different like the Irish identity is is articulated at different times in Chicago and Melbourne. So taking away that distance, I think, would be um, pretty an, an interesting one to kind of add to. Mm-hmm. One question that <clears throat> I have to ask is, how can everyone get your book? Um, well, you can go to Edinburgh University Press. They have it for pre-order. And if you use the... Um, discount code new 30 you get 30 percent off um it is very expensive though so you can also ask very politely at your local library and ask if they can buy it and then um they hope then hopefully you'll be able to read it but also lots of other people can read it so or i think a paperback is coming out um like in a year or so so Yes, but also if anyone has any questions or comments, like feel free to just get in touch with me as well. And I can always, you know, if there's something particular you're interested in, I can always just tell you about it. But also- Great. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Patrick O'Sullivan's also suggested Birmingham into the uh, addition of a city, which, because uh, I think it, it is interesting and thank you for talking through how those two cities would change it. it it's something as well, I think, um, Finding those non-Anglophone countries as well does does bring out a lot of different details. Other comments coming in are just to say thank you, Sophie, and how interesting the talk was from some of our attendees. And I would, of course, echo that. Um, It was brilliant, Sophie. Thanks so much. So if no one else has any other questions, I think we will um, wrap things up uh, so that we can all go and have maybe uh, a drink or a bit of dinner or whatever you have awaiting you guys on the other end of the call. Um, yeah, so that's, I'll, I'll bring things to a close. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you in particular to Sophie for taking the time to share it with us. I hope you all check out Sophie's book. It's fantastic. I was very lucky to have a chance to read it. And I learned a great deal. And it, um, and there's so many different things that we've picked out in the stock that are all fleshed out uh, in so much detail in the book itself. Um, so I hope to see you all at, a, at another event sometime in the future. Um, and thank you, Sophie, again. So that's all from me. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.